Hi everybody, Cale Clark here with the Faith Explained Seminars, thefaithexplained.com. We're with Father Ryan Alamo, who's our chaplain for our trip here, our, our pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And we're here at the Yardinet Baptismal Site, the Jordan River. And let's uh, pick it up here with the Gospel of Mark. We're going to go back to the beginning of the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 1, verse 1 and following. It says, The beginning of the Gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven be torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. So we have that scene of the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan by John. And Father, if you want to just talk to us a little bit about what is the difference between the baptism that John the Baptist was dishing out and that which we receive from Jesus? Well, the baptism that John the Baptist was dishing out was more of a symbolic sort of washing away and uh, a repentance of sins. And so it represented, you know, just kind of uh, the water coming over oneself and being immersed in the water and being washed clean. But with Jesus, Jesus institutes the sacrament of baptism by which now that outward external action of being washed in the river is actually internalized and it's made real by the virtue of the sacrament of baptism and our souls are now cleansed of original sin. We believe this original sin comes to us from Adam and Eve when they first disobeyed God and we as the descendants have inherited this sin and this sort of you know this tendency towards um, preferring to sin let's say what we call concupiscence, uh, the desire to sin being stronger than the desire to do good and so baptism washes us clean of this original sin and this is really the sacrament that Jesus gives us, the sacrament of baptism, and he baptizes and he commands the disciples to go baptize in the nations in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's so great. And, and you know, one question that's often asked is, you know, Jesus was, of course, sinless, so why submit to John's baptism for repentance? Well, I think one reason why Jesus did it, because he believed in what John was doing, the program that John was kind of setting up. Jesus really viewed John as the last Old Testament prophet, if you will leaks into the New Testament period of time and he's wearing of course you know this very interesting outfit right you know he's wearing you know, uh, you know camel's hair it's kind of a rough hair shirt talk about a hair shirt and he's eating locusts and wild honey folks that is super kosher you talk about a kosher diet you don't get more pure than that okay so this is what John was trying to bring about you know this this really radical and the word radical means back to the roots you know we need to get back to God here in a very very powerful way but Jesus didn't, you know, the, the Baptist, he had no sins to repent of, but when Jesus entered the water, the water didn't sanctify him, he sanctified the water. And he gave that water the power to wash away sins. And that's why Catholic baptism, Christian baptism, is different, of course. We receive the Holy Spirit. You know, Pope Benedict, in his book on Jesus of Nazareth, which is such a great book, you should definitely read it, he talked about how Jesus' baptism was really the beginning of his passion. Because to the Jews, we heard about this a little bit on our trip, to the Jews, uh, water was often seen as, as chaos, a symbol of chaos and, and death even. When you read the book of Revelation, the great monsters, the beasts, rise up out of the water, out of the sea. So when Jesus enters into the sea, in a sense, it is the beginning of his progression to the cross and to the grave. And he willingly undertakes this journey for us. So when he rises again uh, with the new life, and the resurrected body that he has still today, he can pour out that gift of the Holy Spirit uh, through baptism. 
very often when you come to this site, and as, as you walk along uh, the banks of the river here, you will see various Christian groups here, and they are getting rebaptized in this water. And you'll say, hey, how come as Catholics we can't do that? That looks like fun. Can we do it? Can we get dunked? Well, I think there's a hygienic reason, number one, why we shouldn't do this, perhaps. You want to comment on that, Father? <laughs> the hygienic reason or the sacramental reason? <laughs> well, maybe both. <laughs> well, as Kale said, you know, um, many theologians, many saints through the ages believe that when the reason Jesus got baptized by John was not because he needed it, but sort of by his baptism he sanctified the waters of the river, the River Jordan. Now, unfortunately, the sanctification of the River Jordan didn't involve its uh, purification or sanitation. And as you can see behind me, the water is very green. Uh, and if you've ever seen water, that's never a healthy color for water to be green. Maybe turquoise blue, I guess, would be not so bad. Um, and so, unfortunately, the river is, uh, is well, filthy for one thing now. Uh, but as to why we don't get rebaptized, when Jesus instituted the sacrament of baptism, it and he sends his disciples out into the world, the church recognizes that baptism really is one of the most important sacraments that we have. And in fact, it is the gateway to all the sacraments. Uh, you know, very often uh, when I'm in the church and you know people come asking for uh, the sacraments, either receive the sacraments of marriage or confirmation or whatnot, the very first question we'll ask them is, are you baptized? Uh, because in order to receive any other sacrament, you need to have received the sacrament of baptism. And because it's so important, and because it has to do with uh, the washing away of original sin, because it has to do with uh, the salvation of our souls, as Jesus has taught us, we believe that uh, one need not be bound only to a baptism that is given by a priest. Uh, ideally, a priest is what we call the ordinary minister of priest, or a, a deacon or a bishop would be the ordinary minister of baptism. However, in extraordinary situations, and up until you know even 50, 60 years ago, uh, many uh, lay nurses in hospitals were trained to baptize uh, babies if they were un in danger of dying soon after being born, uh, precisely because it was recognized it was such an important sacrament for the babies. And so within that theology then it's contained this idea that if someone is baptized, it doesn't matter who baptizes you, whether that person is a, a lay person or a cleric, or even if they are Catholic or not, as long as they intend to baptize you with the, uh, in, with the intent that you will become you know, a Christian, and they baptize you using the formula that Jesus gave us in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, that baptism is considered valid. And so what baptism does then is, as Cale said, when we go through the waters of baptism, we die to that old life of sin, and we are born again as uh, children of God, you know, as His spiritual children. And, and that act of being welcomed into the Christian family is once and for all. Uh, think about our own natural birth, you know, when you're born into a family. And Nicodemus asks Jesus this question, how can it be that someone who's already been born can go into the womb and come again? And Jesus says, no, when I talk about being born again, I don't mean about being spirit, uh, physically born, I talk about spiritually being born. So that same logic of Nicodemus can be applied to our spiritual birth. We can only be born spiritually once. And so that's why we don't have rebaptism. We believe that once somebody is validly baptized, once they've been welcomed into the family of God, that's it, they belong. Whether they choose then to disown that family, whether they choose to walk away from that family, they still belong to the family. Perhaps think of those situations where in our own family members, in our own families, we may have members who have estranged themselves. They belong to us, they relate to us by blood, and whether or not they want to, they still belong to the family. And so that's the same with baptism. Uh, once we are baptized as Christians, we all belong to this Christian family, and so we don't believe uh, in rebaptism. And, and, and one more thing there too is we believe that in baptism, our souls then become you know, marked permanently in a sense uh, as Christians. And again, because it's a permanent uh, uh, demarcation, say, uh, we can't be redone. Yeah, it's, it's almost like indelible ink. You know, God writes an indelible ink on your soul. You are mine. You belong to Christ. And the church even teaches that even the people that uh, don't make it to heaven, sadly, unfortunately, they don't uh, meet God's uh, plan for them, God's will for them to be with Him forever in heaven. Those who are in hell, who have been baptized, still bear that uh, indelible mark uh, on their eternal souls. A great tragedy, and that we don't want that to happen to us or anyone we love or anyone we know. And so that's why it's really important for us to live up to the purpose of our baptism. Why are we baptized? And we know that we have to be baptized, as Father said, it is the most important sacrament of the church. 
because it's the gateway to all the others. Of course, the Eucharist is, is the most powerful because it's Christ himself. But in baptism, we make that all possible. And uh, in Mark's Gospel, at the end of Mark's Gospel, it says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Well, say, what happens to people who haven't been baptized by water and the Holy Spirit, you know, Christian baptism? Well, the church has always held that there are really three types of baptism. There's the normal, you know, mode of baptism, uh, water and the Holy Spirit, and as Father said, in danger of death, all you need is that. You need water and you need to be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son of the, and of the Holy Spirit. Can't be baptized with beer, you know, Molson Canadian, as much as some of you might like that. You know, it has to be water and it has to be in the name of the Trinity. That's why if someone has a valid baptism, when they become Catholic, we don't make them get rebaptized because it's a once for all sacrament. But there's baptism of there's water in the spirit. There's also baptism of blood. The church has always taught that those who've shed their blood for Jesus Christ, who have become martyrs for the faith, if they hadn't been physically baptized yet, the very shedding of their blood count, you know, covers them and counts as their baptism. And there's also one more, it's called baptism of desire. What happens if you're in the RCIA class? It's not Easter, you know, it's the night before and you get hit by a truck you know, before you can be baptized. God's gonna say, oh, sorry, you didn't quite make it to the Easter vigil, of course not. You know, your desire was to be baptized, your desire was to do that will of Christ, but by means, you know, not of your control, you weren't able to make it. So. We, the church has always held that those who seek the truth and are following the truth as best they can with a pure heart, that, that is enough. It's called baptism of desire. They're seeking God. They're seeking the truth. Perhaps no one has ever told them about Jesus Christ. It's different now. If you, if you get the gospel explained to you and then you reject it, that's another story. But uh, for those who are, who are catechumens, they, they believe in Jesus, they just haven't been baptized yet, baptism of desire would, would cover them. Uh, if something were to happen to them before they could be physically uh, baptized. Why are we baptized? Just one last thing. We are baptized to become saints. That's our calling, plain and simple. We are called to become little Christ. That's what the word Christian means, it means little Christ. If Jesus were you, walking in your shoes, living in your family, working at your job with your relatives, your particular friends and things you have to deal with, what would you do? It's like that WWJD bracelet the kids used to wear all the time. What would Jesus do? Oddly enough, I once knew a guy who stole his brother's WWJD <laughs> bracelet when they were really trendy. I don't think Jesus would do that. That's very ironic. But, but what are we called to do? We're called to, to really replicate the life of Jesus in our own lives. We hear those words that Jesus heard in his baptism. You are my son. God calls us his sons and daughters. He literally, we do become part of God's family. We share his, his divine life, the spark of that within us when we're baptized. And just as God said, let there be light, it happened. What God says actually has power to do what he says he's doing. And he says, you're my son, you're my daughter in baptism. That's what we become. And so we're called to be saints. We're called to be the best version of ourselves. Not some strange guy that nobody wants to talk to because he's just hyper-religious, really weird, very, in a very, very natural way. It's like those great frescoes in the Sistine Chapel painted by Michelangelo. For years and centuries, they gathered dust and grime, and, and the, the true beauty was obscured. That's like our sin. You know, when it's washed away, just like those beautiful images were finally cleaned at the Vatican by an expert crew, the glory of the original could be shown. And each one of us is a unique creation, unrepeatable. There'll never be another you. And your job is to become the best version of yourself with God's help and help other people to do that too. It's to become a saint and to help other people become saints. That's called apostle, that's called evangelism, it's called sharing the gospel. And we try to do that in a very, very natural way. So that's really uh, uh, just a little catechesis for you on baptism at this baptismal site uh, here in Yard England. Okay, so now that the video's done, are there any questions?